Having already done a deep dive on the battery packs, the cheap Chinese tools, the ones that have the charge port that you just basically stuff the little jack into, uh, not bad, not bad circuitry inside. Not all of them though, some of them are bad circuitry. However, here is the charger, and that's the subject of this video. This is the UK version. The case will just vary between different versions. And it says lithium battery charger model YH2120. And it says input 100 to 240 volts, 50, 60 hertz. Output DC 12 volts at 2 amps. Now, I have to say, I've tested it under various loads and it never reached 2 amps. It uh, reached 500 milliamps was the best it got to. Now, let's bring in a meter. And we shall measure the open circuit output voltage. Technically speaking, the cells themselves, the battery, should I say, should cut off when they reach their full voltage. But this air goes up to 21.5. Okay, that's reasonable enough. It's a good enough voltage. Technically speaking, if this has... Uh, let me grab my kink calculator here. The kink calculator has disappeared. If we have the classic 18 volt pack and we've got five cells, then theoretically they could charge to 4.2 volts each times five equals 21 volts. So that gives that slight margin as well. Although there is a diode in the battery pack as well. So maybe it doesn't quite get there, but that's good. Slight undercharging is good. Anyway, let's see if we can open it. And there are no obvious signs of screws. That is just a sort of Laser etched label by the look of it. It's got that slight abrasive feel or just molded Um, I've got the spudger here. Is this gonna work? Is it gonna be ultrasonically welded or oh, it does look as though it may It may open Which way up does the uh, spudger slip in it slips in up that way This may take a while And it may be a one-way trip. It may be destructive Oh, actually, no, no, this is good. This is actually better than I was expecting. So the lip is going, oh, well, the lip is going down the way. Okay, then I shall stick the spudger in the other direction. Maybe it's just not going to go in at all. Maybe I should just use a screwdriver to prise this apart in a destructive manner. There's a screwdriver. That, that sounds like it's doing the job. Is it going to be a super tiny circuit board? Oh, you're allowed to make guesses now before we actually see the circuitry inside here. Tiny circuit board. Is it going to be glued in or is it going to be into a frame? Is it going to have uh, opto-isolated feedback protection, uh, voltage uh, setting <coughs> or regulation? And is the output going to be just a simple transistor for change the colour of the LED when the load is low across a resistor? Or is it going to be an LM358? The reveal. Okay, so it's a bigger circuit board than I expected. The output side has the transistor. Uh, and a resistor, that's going to get a very hot resistor. What about the... It's literally just held in place by foam. Is there opto-isolated feedback? No, there is not. There's not even a class Y capacitor. Okay. Right. Well, the foam's are over the bit we want to see. I should actually make sure this is discharged, shouldn't I? Before I get little tingles. So let me hold it by the foam and use a metal screwdriver to bridge that. Yeah, that's, that's discharged. That's fine. <clears throat> okay, tell you what. I shall take a picture of this, reverse engineer it, and then we can explore the circuitry together. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete, and there are two things that really annoy me about this really over cheapified design. Let me zoom down now. The first thing that annoys me, and it's not the easy pop apart case, which is held with two clips on each side and a little lip there to try and stop it popping apart when you open, when you pull it out the socket. It's not the fact it's missing the class Y capacitor for interference suppression. It's not even the fact that it's got a suspiciously unknown safety level of transformer as these things have. It's the fact that the foam pad that was holding this circuit board in place was directly sandwiched on top of the chip that gets the hottest. It's doing all the work. This chip here is the main switching power supply chip, so you don't really want to press foam, uh, thermal insulating foam against it. But things get worse for that chip. It's going to have a very rough life. 
I'm not even sure how long it's going to last. But the other components they've left off are the snubber network. A diode here, a resistor here, and a little capacitor that would have been mounted through a hole. And the purpose of that is to catch the slight transient, the light, the slight spike every time the transistor in this turns off and it protects the transistor from that damage. They've just missed that out. It's shown in every example circuit in the manufacturer's data sheet as well. It's just like they've, they've omitted it. So this is a universal design. This circuit board is, de is designed to slit into, slit, slot into different cases. And because of that, it's got multiple positions for the main screen. It's also got that odd resistor position there that is not occupied, which goes to the bootstrap circuit. I have, I did see a Dowd Gone Wild video where there was a, uh, resistor, the bootstrap resistor was from the actual primary side before the, well, the incoming side before the bridge rectifier. I wonder if that's what they were trying to do there, but it's not a good idea. They did this here. And the bootstrap works because it had to work when I was testing it. Here's a chip. Here's the little current sense resistor. There's a voltage divider that actually sets the voltage on the output by uh, a feedback winding. There is no opto isolation. Um, on the secondary, we've got a rectifying diode, just standard silicon high-speed diode, not a shot key. And then we've got a very interesting arrangement. We've got the current limiting resistor, but also a diode in series with it, because ultimately this is limiting the current. Oh, this incidentally is a USB power supply chip. It's designed for 5 volts at 2 amps. It's putting out 20 volts, so it's quarter of an amp. That's uh, why they've set that current ultimately. It's been decided by the capacity of this chip. Uh, but also on the secondary side, we've got that little current limiting uh, bit, and then we've got the LED drive circuit. It's basic, it's very simple, it's very standard, and I'll show you it. It basically measures the volts drop across these. Let me show you the first part of the schematic, which is from the manufacturer of the chip. I shall zoom out a bit. I just felt I had to put the whole thing in because A, it's a bit fuzzy, because the data sheet was not high resolution, but I also love the name Shenzhen Fine Mad Electronics Group. That's a great name for a company. Um, I've come across their chips before, probably this one. Here's a bit of direct fire. There's the smoothing capacitor, 4.7 megafarad, 400 volt death beam capacitor. They've omitted one of the bootstrap resistors. They've just used a single resistor, so it is under stress as well, and it's charging that little capacitor there. When you turn it on, initially current flows through this resistor, charges up this capacitor until it reaches a threshold, and then this can start running. As soon as it starts running, it pulses the primary. Uh, some of that current's transferred over to the secondary. Some of it comes back via the feedback winding through this diode, and then takes over the row of that resistor by keeping that uh, resistor charged. If you short the output, it will clamp that voltage down. It will actually cause the voltage across that capacitor to fall until the chip cuts out and then it'll do its reboot sequence again. It'll go down to a sort of lower threshold voltage and then it'll charge via this resistor again. And that's why it does that sort of bump, 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 hiccup thing that you see the LED lights doing because that's the same thing. The feedback is also doing the sensing of the voltage across the feedback winding, which mirrors the voltage across the secretary winding, given a bit of scale. And it is going to these two resistors here that form a potential divider. I've written a question mark next to the 25K one because it's one of the most vaguest. I'd have to remove that. Uh, 2502, I think, but it's like Z, uh, ZSOZ. It's just like, it's not like this nice curvaceous two and five that look the part and these numbers look the part, 912, that's nine. 0.1,000 ohms, 912 zeros. But this one is just very vague. So I'd, if I was reverse engineering this to copy it, which I'm not, I would desolder that resistor just to double check that value. Or I'd just shuffle values to suit myself. Uh, and there's the current sense resistor that sets the threshold uh, of current flowing through the primary and the transistor that it, the chip turns off again and then lets the field collapse. So the operation of this is that the when it's running, this is a transistor inside. It turns on that primary, puts a magnetic field into the core, then it turns off, that field collapses. Some of it goes in the secondary through the diode into the capacitor. It just basically it's portioning through chunks of current. Uh, but also that's mirrored in the feedback, which does the powering of the chip and also the feedback winding. Right, okay, let's take a look at the secondary side. There is a bit of the secondary side. Here's the rest of it with the fancy LED sophisticated charge status analysis which doesn't really mean an awful lot it just gives you an indication of how much current let's go let's go closer get closer here is the secondary winding 
and it's going through that diode um, which is a standard ES2D, it's a high speed silicon diode, not short key, which is good because they're kind of more robust really but there's slightly higher losses but they don't give a toss about that because it's only 500 milliamps there's the capacitor on the secondary side, 35 volt, 100 microfarad with a 3.3k load resistor just to provide stability of the circuitry in the primary side. It means that uh, ultimately, I guess, it means that the circuitry, if this is a low load in this side to the point that there's no feedback, not much feedback at all, going to the uh, the feedback winding to keep charging that capacitor, I guess this little load here just makes sure that every so often it pecks and it just provides that bit of current. That's a guess. It may also stop the voltage across this flying up too high. Here's the LED drive circuitry. So there is some current limiting. There's a diode and a 2.4 ohm resistor. I think it's less to do with current limiting and more to do with just the sensing of the uh, the charge status. So the current flows through that diode and the resistor. The, ultimately, the diode's going to do most of the work first. It, the earlier version, there's just a, a resistor, and the resistor would get very, very hot. In this case, it's a fair low-value resistor because the voltage across it is always clamped to about one volt by this diode. So most of the current is flowing through that, and as the voltage gradually rises, uh, the diode will probably turn off, and then this resistor will gradually pull it as it floats up towards the positive rail. Um, the LEDs are both fed by a single 10K resistor, quite a high value. It's also worth mentioning that the LED isn't super bright, but it's just, uh, it's roughly in the vicinity of this light guide, and it just points and roughly some of the light will get into the light guide and be visible in the front. That's more or less it. It would be nice if they'd actually poked the LED through the front. It would have been so much brighter. You could do that if you wish. But the green LED is a higher forward voltage, so that when the red LED is turned on by this transistor, it actually clamps the voltage across there to the point the green LED can't light up. And initially, the red LED is on, because as it's charging, the voltage across here will be roughly a diode drop under load, which will just be a bit over 0.6 volts, which is enough to go via this 2.2k resistor and turn this uh, transistor on, because this is a PNP transistor. It's turned on by pulling it lower than the positive rail. Uh, so as long as there is a potential difference across here, uh, this transistor will be turned on and the red charge LED will be on. When the, the current is too low through this, when the battery is fully charged, or when the battery itself, the uh, management system, just turns off, it will basically turn that transistor off because uh, then it will sort of float straight up to the positive rail. And because the red LED is now off, the green LED will light to indicate that the charge is complete. That's it. It's about as cheap and easy as you could get. So there we have it. It's not quite what I was expecting. I did expect it to be super cheap and easy and simple. But uh, missing the snubber network is a cardinal sin. Uh, putting foam pad over a hot chip is also a cardinal sin. Um, but it is functional, I guess. It'd be nice to populate those uh, component positions. I'd need a little high-speed diode. Uh, a suitable resistor, probably 200 20k would probably do it and then a, a capacitor just something like one or two nanofarad probably ample and that would uh, provide that extra protection but i'd have to go and look at some other circuits to see what they'd used but there we have it uh, a super duper cheap super flimsy super lightweight power supply for charging those very functional chinese tools but i think they could have done a bit better with this but they didn't but that's okay